You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. And go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to All Things 3D, Friday edition. Today is January 16th, 2015. I'm your co-host, Chris Kopak. We've got Mike Balzer, co our co-host and producer, and a special guest today, guest crasher, Dr. Scott Cleos, who Hi, has, guys. has been with us before, hey, a good friend of ours, and, uh, and uh, always happy to have him on our program, a uh, uh, real special uh, special guest today. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about our news items um, and kind of what's, uh, what's going on, maybe a little bit of recap, a lot of recap of uh, what happened at CES. Mike uh, went to CES the 2015 in Las Vegas last week, and we did uh, like like a kindergarten story. Mike goes to CES. Oh, it was great, man. Uh, we we had a lot of fun. I I uh, I kind of stayed back home and uh, and uh, he did a virtual walkthrough. So if you haven't had a chance, go check it out. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, All things 3D. We walk around. If you want to see some uh, maybe in depth interviews. Uh, of, of some funky, cool 3D stuff um, that you might not get anywhere else. Go check it out. It's really fun. Yeah, and keep in mind, everyone, and, and by the way, you've heard of eating out of your wife's hand. Well, I've taken <laughs> that to heart. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a big, we had a big, we had a big news, uh, a news item uh, uh, break yeah. with Mike. And, and I'll, I'd like to talk about it a little bit more, too. Um, obviously, as many stories, there's some inaccuracy, and I, I'd like to discuss that. And one of the reasons it we, we didn't bring Scott on specifically for the purpose of my article, but uh, uh, it was more for the GE, but obviously he's a great candidate to be on our show uh, because I think the most of them. He has some great videos if you don't know a lot about the technology. Plus the fact is he's also a gearhead. Uh, he has an engineering background so he brings a different perspective. But on that note, as Chris said, we did a, a few live, as we'll call them, Google Hangouts on air at the show. I had set up a special rig so that I could do that and Chris is in the background um, monitoring everything as we were going along. But the quality suffers a little bit, so I took a secondary camcorder, HD 1080p, and filmed it, edited it, and put it back up. Uh, that adds actually some more footage, so you might want to go out to that. The show notes will have all the links, but if you're in a hurry, it's out on YouTube right now. Uh, just look for the HD version. It's the same as the other version. The, the field of view on the camcorder is a little tighter, and so it's off to one side, so I don't have framing as accurate as I did in the, uh, the, uh, the, the live camera, but it's still adequate. And like I said, it is 1080p, so you do get some extreme uh, quality that you wouldn't otherwise. So if you really want to scrutinize some of the 3D printers we saw, and there were a plenty, uh, this is the third, I wouldn't say third, but I think over the last three years it has just grown. I think it's four times the size or three times the size it was last year. So it is impressive and uh, truly enjoyed it. Uh, it is huge. I tried to do some other things at CES, eventually get to a sip it all, but you know, that's the kindergarten story. Mike tries <laughs> to get to a sip it all because it took me hours to get there. You have to take a shuttle to the other part of the convention and you wade through thousands of people and hopefully I captured some of that. So it was fun. I also got to do an interview with Fuel 3D, uh, Stuart Mead, very nice guy. And uh, that's also up there. If you're interested in a a decent, fast 3D scanner with good resolution, it's going to be about $1,500. Um, they are just fulfilling their Kickstarter, so it'll be a couple of months. Software is still uh, in its infancy, and that is still coming along. But uh, take a look at that interview, and you'll get an example of how that thing works. So on that note, Chris, why don't you head right into the news and I see that you've got something up there. So uh, first, I gotta say, man, I'm super proud of you and your wife both for like stepping out there and kind of like putting this up and uh, putting this out there. And uh, although we do have our reservations about some uh, media bias or I don't know, should we say media embellishment a little yeah, bit? I, I mean, uh, the I, I like to say right off. 
I cannot say that I was responsible for saving the sight of her left eye. The important thing is that the two of us was very proactive and if we had waited longer uh, there's a possibility that the atrophy would have set in and she would have either lost partial sight or all of it because of the way this tumor had entangled in the optic nerve. And in saying yes. that, yeah. um, you know, there is still 5% of the tumor still there but it's on the optic nerve and you know, the surgeons told me, and I will m mention them by name, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Stepko um, identified that, you know, we felt uh, that it was more important to remove the majority of it and not mess with the optic nerve. And Siobhan and I both agreed with that wholeheartedly. And they left a little door in with a knob that they can open up and get back in there if they need to. No, just so, kidding. So for those who don't know what we're talking about, Make uh, released an article uh, with uh, Associated Press, right? Was it Associated Press that AP? No, Make just... Um, the it was whole Make back only. story is that about a month ago, Sarah, I don't remember what her last name is, uh, she... Uh, Bresselor. She did an interview with me, and actually we did it over Skype, so we both communicated with another. And I kind of went through my chronicle of view, uh, view of the entire process, how I involved 3D printing, how I had sent a 3D skull to the surgeons, how I set imagery to multiple uh, surgeons uh, around the country. And we just kind of went through this whole thing. And then she kind of kept me abreast and then gave me a call and said, well, is this the chronicle? facts and, and for the most part she got all that right um, however she had no control over the title of this article so obviously it is dramatic and you know I will not take credit the, the surgeons require all the credit as far as removing it properly and in the health that she is now you know, but a really the, good story really good story uh, so if, if you want to go check it out it's up on make uh, makezine.com and uh, it actually has made the front page of reddit even and uh, right there, Mike Balzer, and the article is pretty in depth. It goes it goes on and on about how uh, you um, found the CAT scans or got got a hold of the DICOMs and kind of what we've gone over in our workshops before and uh, and uh, used some open source software to basically reconstruct an STL, 3D print the STL, and you can which you can of course even view the STL, which I thought was really cool that they included uh, the Sketchfab stuff um, of yeah. Siobhan's skull. And and uh, here's the skull itself. And so yeah, that, Mike, that was the first, actually, was that the first? It was the first skull, and that was done on a MakerBot Replicator 2, and that is the one. And I actually made two of them and sent them out to Johns Hopkins and UPMC. Um, and Dr. Gardner came back to me and said, we passed it around our planning table. Um, you know, I think it was, you know, I don't know how much useful it was in the actual surgical process, but um, it did invite a lot of discussion and the importance, since they're also a training hospital, of the potential of utilizing this. Uh, this kind of technology. So it, it was funny when I got there and I also presented him another uh, skull that was cut in half with the brain in it and he viewed it and he said, is this mine? And I said, well, yeah. do you want it? Yes. So obviously they do think it's, it's a unique process. But in saying that, you know, we've kind of gone through a whole story arc since this occurred in May and, you know, in this country um, there is a lot of regulation and that kind of minimizes what we can do in this area and uh, however that is changing so you know if you're wondering why in this country you don't see more of it like you're doing you're seeing in England in fact that's one of my story items how a guy printed out his kidney um, um, or in Australia or China you know part of it is the FDA but you know as this gets more and more news and we're seeing it more um, and one person addressed that you know we've already been doing this Again, I'm not taking credit for any of this uh, engineering or technology. I just utilized a lot of the open source tools and things out there. But you did it, Mike. You took. Okay. You went through the step of getting the. I mean, I remember I was there the whole time with you when you were. We were doing some stuff at your house, and you were showing me all this stuff, and you were so fired up about it because, basically. The there was there was a set of doctors and they had one interpretation of the CAT scan data and you said 
I don't think that I don't think that they've they've they they're gonna do it the right way. I I ha- I th- I think that they can do this a better way, and I think we can find a doctor in a place that's not where we are locally in California. And you were right. I mean, you you went and you went, did took the steps, which is exactly uh, what you needed to do. I personally believe that um, you know doctors are amazing at helping people, and they definitely serve a purpose. But at the end of the day, you are your best doctor. And like a lot of times, a doctor is just telling you stuff. They're just reassuring, reaffirming things that you're telling them. They're good listeners. The best doctors are good listeners. They're telling you what you're telling them, and they're just they're basically giving you a medical interpretation of it, and maybe giving you a much more thorough background of it. But what you did is you you allowed you provided more information to the doctors, something that you couldn't communicate through. Siobhan couldn't communicate this stuff. You put it in a visual visual actual data set and 3D printed it and brought it to doctors and that allowed them to do you know to do a better job yeah well we hope so and as you said uh, it was a we it was her and she did a lot of the research herself and I supported her and, and made sure that the information got to where it was at and yes it it was very helpful and very eye-opening as part of the story I believe is correct it was eye-opening uh, there was some some issues in certain areas with diagnosis and uh, reports, but um, you know that's why you have to stay on top of it. With that, I'd like to um, bring in Dr. Cleos. Um, he is, in my opinion, an expert radiologist out of Florida, and he has not only a medical background but an engineering background. And why I brought him in in previous, uh, both an interview and then the medical seminar that we did is that uh, he really understands the technology behind this. So, you know, you know, I have three items, so I'm just going to kind of go through them one at a time, and then maybe you can just kind of chime in. But before we do so, I, I don't know if you read the article, uh, Dr. Cleo's. Um, I did have one radiologist that took offense to it that, uh, you know, I was... Uh, coming down on the medical community and again I want to reassure people that if it weren't for the medical community she wouldn't be standing right now or she would still have these severe headaches so let's just emphasize I didn't do the surgery um, all I did is the information to find the the experts that we needed to do this and get her back on her feet uh, for the most part pain-free uh, I can't say that the headaches are completely gone but we don't really know what the origin is of them um, but um, as they said three weeks later she was back working and that wouldn't have happened um, without the expert surgeon so with that being said um, Dr. Cleo's what, what is your take on it? Do you feel that you know, I overstepped my boundaries or um, do you feel that people need to be more of their advocate? Uh? No, a- absolutely, Mike. I-, I don't think you upper- overstepped your bounds at all. And I think uh, in the modern relationship between a doctor and the patient has changed dramatically. It used to be very patriarchal. You would come in, see your doctor, and the doctor would examine you and uh, make clinical decisions uh, based on what he felt was the best for you. Patients have changed dramatically. You still see some of that old paradigm with the patriarchal type of uh, uh, relationship with the MD or the DO, uh, but most patients now come in with a, a level of sophistication that varies depending on their training and what they looked up on the internet. I really believe that a good doctor is one who is willing to take the inquiries of an individual, of a patient or their family, and basically separate the wheat from the chaff. We are in an age where information is available at the touch of a button. We can all get access to the internet, look up stuff about our disease processes, and come in fairly sophisticated about what we're dealing with. Um, I don't think any physician should take offense to that. As a matter of fact, I encourage my patients to go out and actually look for information because they may, as Chris alluded to, bring in something that you'll overlook. I mean, they're the one with the problem, and if they have a clinical issue that's not coming to mind, they may say, hey, I read about this on the internet, and I think my symptoms are similar, and you guys can discuss that. But um, we have a clinic where I sit down with patients, and I try to show them 
a lot of times in 3D models of what we've got going on and how I'm going to intervene and treat them. Now, at the same time, I do think you're obligated to go in there and dispel some of the myths that these patients may uh, come in with. And I think if you encounter a physician who takes offense to that type of interaction, you need to find another physician for sure. So, so I, I don't, I don't think you overstepped your bounds at all. Now, how much does the 3D modeling in this particular situation, how did that affect surgery? Of course, I have no idea. A, I'm not a surgeon. B, I wasn't there to actually Well, let me see. give you the backstory behind that. Uh, sure. Even as, you know, Dr. Gardner said, it's very interesting. You can see it as a great training tool. But as you know, as a radiologist, you're trained to look at 2D images and perceive three-dimensional information from that. You're trained to do that. That and is exactly is, right. And because he is what they call a stereotactic surgeon, he is also trained to do so. Exactly. In fact, the, the, uh, the clinic or the radiology department at Samsung in Santa Barbara was flabbergasted in the precision that he requested for her latest MRI. I mean, this guy, I think, is also very gifted in that area as well, not just as a surgeon, but understanding the technology and what to get out of it. Uh, and so they had never seen anything like that before. And in saying that, he said what is still missing and that you don't really get until you're actually in there is the super detail. Uh, as you know already, CTs, even though we can see nice imagery, it doesn't have the precision uh, or the resolution. And in the case of um, Siobhan's tumor, she had uh, tentacles, as he referred to them, growing from the mass of tumor that could not be seen in the tangible model or in some of the volume rendering and did not notice this until he actually was in there. This is why it took eight hours because they were literally with micro drills drilling each of these components out. And if you looked at some of the models, the one that uh, they presented in the Sketchfab, you know, sadly there's a large hole there, but what would happen is eventually this would continue to grow. And you know, as I've emphasized before, Scott, um, her mother died at an early age of a brain tumor, which is the biggest reason that I have been trying to get her to get an MRI. And she had previous um, headaches, but when they were ongoing, and it, it was really aggravating, and actually I, I, it made me angry that uh, the initial neurologist, or maybe it was in the second one, insisted that it had nothing to do with that, but out of a courtesy to me, he would schedule the MRI. A right, courtesy right. to me. Right. And, and this is what really just kind of grabbed me and said, you know, it's angry, and obviously he no longer was her neurologist, but we sure, have found sure. that there is a difference between neurologists and neurosurgeons, and a lot of them do not understand the surgical process, uh, which we found a little surprising. But there are a lot of things we found through the discovery that, you know, people have expertises or generalities, and you just need to keep looking. Um, you know, the other thing we found out is the East Coast seems to have more expertise in this minimally evasive uh, a neurosurgery process that was used on her. Uh, the West Coast does not have that. They still use traditional craniotomy techniques. That is changing. One of the fellows for Dr. Gardner has uh, come to the West Coast to uh, not necessarily set up his own clinic, but to impart this, I think, to Stanford. So they are moving in that direction on the West Coast as well. Uh, sadly, I don't remember his name right now, but I, um, if I Go back through my notes, I'll find it, and I'll put it in the show notes. So if you are on the West Coast or close to the West Coast, I would, I'd really like you to look at him. He was an excellent. I mean, he, we had a lot of dialogue as well, and he was very excited about the 3D potential as well. But, you know, as Dr. Cleo has mentioned, radiologists are trained to look at 2D. Most human beings like 3D because that's how we look. We have stereoscopic vision. And so we can perceive things better with 3D. You know, how important it is to them. One thing I will say that uh, is going to be happening in the future, and I've talked to some other researchers, is the ability to use this new 3D scanning technology to determine depth. So literally use it to determine where they're at on the patient and overlaying 3D models so that you have 
uh, kind of an augmented reality, and um, there is a lot of work being done in that. So similar to the stereotactic in the sense of where you're using CT or MRI, two-dimensional image, we're now looking at creating 3D volumes and doing the same thing, and using these new 3D scanners to provide the depth information to know exactly where you're at at all times. So think of it like 3D GPS information for a surgeon. Uh, I think that's really cool and a great potential. Yeah. We actually have those technologies now. I mean, you know, that does give us the, um, uh, like you referred to, GPS. And that, there was a, a piece of equipment that came out about 10 years ago. It actually was a local GPS. It was interesting. It was developed by a OBGYN from Israel who was also a fighter pilot. You know, the Israelis, I think all of them have to <laughs> spend some military time. So he used the technology that he used to fly to basically take CT scans of patients with fiduciary markers, which are fixed points that you use as a reference. And then he had a needle that you could actually um, hook up to this machine and it could localize the needle in 3D space and you would interact with the patient and it would superimpose that CT data so that you could guide this needle right in. So that, that technology now actually isn't that exists. Referred to, yeah, isn't that referred to as stereotactic, if, if I understand? Uh, isn't the, that, or this is, is that, even more so. That, okay. Yeah. This is uh, even so more so. They, yeah, they do stereotactic and they, they again, use the fiduciary markers in, in a similar fashion and they'll do that a lot of times for brain tumors. And uh, uh, But this was actually, you could localize stuff outside the patient, inside the patient, very interesting stuff. There's still some wow. limitations, especially when you're dealing with, you know, the breathing patient. You have to be able to, uh, you know, accommodate for the movement of the organs based on uh, respiratory movement. But I no, it's that's a, a good amazing point, stuff. Too. Yeah, that's a good point because you know, it's like there, it's like uh, the comet Philae. It's like you're, it's moving, so you can't. Yeah, I mean, that's a really. Uh, That's that right. That adds a whole other dimension to the. Absolutely, it's one thing to do that on a stationary uh, piece of equipment, or to do it on a model that's not moving. But on a living, breathing human being, you've got the 4D factor to take into consideration. But our scanners are improving, you know, every year, yeah, and they're and getting faster we're and faster. Talk about, um, soon. So let me get into my first medical item. Um, let me bring it up real quick. And one, and this actually is not a news item per se, but somebody that uh, had responded in the had just gone to a seminar or a presentation on this. And one of the things that I ran into is uh, all the DICOM images. And for those of you who don't know, what does that stand for? Some, uh, I can't remember the acronym. Uh, diagnostic imaging something or <laughs> imaging medical something rather. Uh, yeah. The last term, but essentially it is a a, a file data set of images with uh, uh, specific data information for each of those images as well as data on the patient and it's all contained in a container and they call it DICOM. The reason they created this is because as you know I think uh, Dr. Cleo is going to attest to there are a variety of manufacturers of CT and MRIs and they all have their own mm, what would you call it machine code well, they had so a proprietary to... format for their for their images, and the problem is their proprietary format didn't communicate with anything else. So in the beginning, when all of your exams were local, uh, you know it wasn't that big of a problem. You, the way they used to record uh, the data off a CT scan back in the 1970s is they actually had a Polaroid camera set up right in front of the screen, and they would take a what we would call a screenshot nowadays, but it was with an actual. <laughs> That's how they would record your images. Uh... So, you know, the actual data layout didn't matter, but that changed with the digital age where you could now make these images portable and you could transfer them across networks. And now they had to find out a standard so that these machines could communicate to each, with each other, and that's where the DICOM standard came about. That's pretty incredible. And it's very important. So getting back to this real quick. So what somebody has done is that, uh, the thing that we ran into is that we had to send literally physical disk uh, to the multiple hospitals uh, through the United States and then when she had her thyroid removed we sent it actually I think to Korea as well um, so it can be um, I guess overall that wasn't that expensive but there's an expense to that but more importantly time yeah we wanted to get 
feedback back as soon as possible when you're waiting for a week or in one case it was lost and we had to resend it this just seems like the direction to go and uh, this particular company identifies that they are HIPAA compliant uh, they use encrypted servers and um, for the patient it is fairly reasonable I think it's like six to eight dollars a month for a doctor however I think the costs are a little a little high but uh, you know you guys are rich just <laughs> not uh, anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. We used to be, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we have they have expenses as well, and you know the fees have changed in their pricing. So I think that uh, I hope that. Um, well, did you look at the pricing on here? We'll look at the pricing together. So if you an organization, it's four fifty, eight hundred, fourteen hundred. Um, and it tells you what you get for that. If you're a doctor, it's sixty dollars a month, one hundred and ten, two fifty, <laughs> or if you're an institution, call. So does that? <laughs> and then if you're a patient, as I said, it's reasonable. You can set up a personal account for two dollars a month, family account for five dollars a month, and you can put up. Now, um, Dr. Cleos, I sent you these uh, or some links last night. Did you get those? Did you get the emails identifying that? Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, I got some of them, so I, I did not see this, but uh, I am familiar with these type of uh, organizations that are coming down the pike right now. So. Okay, well, that's the, uh, I think that's a side note. I had sent a couple of me, or actually put it in image 32, your email address, and I assume that it was sending you an email to, um, to review some DICOMs that I put up there. Um, and I wanted to talk about mine personally. They have a viewer built into it, but as you said, if it didn't actually... No, I did see that. I saw the viewer. Yeah, I didn't know that was related to this, but yes, I did see the images pop up. I saw your oh, okay. CT scan, Good. so yeah, All you right. can talk about that if, you, if you'd like. So Yeah, I, I don't... You know, actually, let's see if I can log in. It was actually pretty neat when I was logging on and I could see your images come up. I thought that was pretty... Because I'm looking at it on my iPhone. I'm like, wow, oh. that's pretty good. Pull up yeah, my yeah. Actually, if you, if you saw it there, it is, it is Android and um, iOS savvy. So we're going to skip. Wow. So, so I put two of them in here, and I will um, not bring up my wife's, but I'll bring up mine. And uh, for our audience out there, these are realistic <laughs> CT scans of my lower anatomy. So oh, with that great. Means, don't yeah. go too low, Mike. Don't go too low. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too low. Yeah, it's too low. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, just ignore that. Uh, <laughs> Can we get a black that? bar? Is this a family show? Or? <laughs> yeah. uh, I I gotta go do okay. some three D printing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I changed it. Uh, okay. Luckily, my screen has changed, and don't see how red I am. <laughs> but what's so funny is that I used three D slicer to create a three D volume of it, and we did it to, for one of our three D meeting group. And I said, I don't know if this is the one that's going to show that. Luckily, it wasn't. But man, I was ready there. But you know how well. These are I, would have, I would have photoshopped it before I did a 3D model of it for sure. So but that's just me. Well, like I said, it, there's two different models. Actually, if you go, I think there's another one that doesn't go that far. However, uh, it does do over the cloud the ability it has its own viewer or you can download them and use your own um, DICOM viewer. Well, what's interesting is you are actually changing the window and level as as we're talking, yeah, press, which, exactly. which allows yeah. you to see, you know, the problem with CT, as we've discussed previously, is there's more information than the human eye can actually um, um, uh, see. It can actually, that's exactly right. You can see about 22 shades of gray. We're looking at almost uh, probably 5,000 shades of gray on that CT scanner. So your dog may be able to see that image a lot better than we can. Uh, well, but probably, unfortunately, uh, in because, medical school. So, uh, but, uh, well, the other thing too, Scott, is that a lot of LCD panels do not have the gamut to be able to see all those right. shades that you're talking about. In fact, most of them can't even see 256 shades of gray unless That's you right. have a professional monitor. But uh, what's, what, what Mike's doing is he's actually changing the center gray and then putting a window around that so you can accentuate the, uh, the different uh, information on that CT scanner and see right now it's a bone window. And as he changes it, you can accentuate lung detail and then soft tissue, which we're going into right now. And so the radiologist 
psychologist will go through all these different windows and come up with a, uh, you know, process all of this information and come up with a dictation. Hopefully, that will include all the information that's on your scan. And that's why this is so uh, important. This particular technology is important in trauma patients because they come in and they can't communicate with you sometimes. This scan that we can now do in less than 30 seconds will give you information about the soft tissue, see if the lungs are popped, which we call a pneumothorax, are the bones broken, is there internal bleeding that's active. So you get a tremendous amount of information from this one scan just by changing through the windows and the levels. But And this little portable uh, device that you, uh, uh, or, or the cloud that you're using allows you, it's, it's obviously sending over full functional, fully functional images that you can window and level. It's great. Yeah, and the actual process, you know, if you're not familiar with the DICOM folder structure, it might be a little daunting, but uh, essentially they, I wouldn't say they guide you through it, but they identify you need to look for something that has a .dcm suffix on it or nothing, but it'll be a series of um, numeric um, files, and then you just drag and drop those into their cloud, and about five minutes later, depending upon the your um, your bandwidth of your internet connection, uh, they're up in the cloud, and then it gives you the opportunity to put in an email address of the person you want to review them. And you know, I did this last night around two, I think two o'clock, three o'clock. So immediately when Dr. Cleos woke up or got into the clinic, he'd get an email, and he could click on it, or in his case, he just clicked on his email and it brought up the browser and he could review these on his iOS phone. Do you have an and iPhone? Yes, and that's exactly what I did. I got up this morning on my way to the gym at 4.30 and saw your email message. You know. so it how looks like you can even is. start a, 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 you can start a conference even, so you could have like a consult. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that's exactly right. So what that's they need right. to do now is implement yeah, fact, a little, like, a little when I square. Click on it. You know the square appointments thing that they have, so you can mon like no. the doctor could monetize it. Like so, what they need to do, like take it to the next, probably the next thing is like to have, hey, not a conference but an appointment with the doctor, so you could like, uh, you know, and well, know how much see. it's going to cost. Well, the fact that this eventually. is available now and yeah, something that I wish was available in the last two years since I had to send a lot of this information. But the other thing is we need to find somebody who's open to it and is comfortable in using the technology. And that's also another hurdle for many in the medical community as we found out. But on that note, so as, as Dr. Cleo said, you do have the ability. The other thing I didn't show, and I think it works, let's see, does it work? Yeah. Uh, notice how I can also go through the different slices. That's right. So not only can I vary the the intensity or the, the threshold uh, level or the dynamic range, I can also go through all the slices with the, the, the mouse wheel. So it's very intuitive and um, it works fairly well. Now I'm working on an i5 machine, so it's not the beefiest machine and it still looks pretty dynamic. The only thing is this only provides 2D or standard ICOM viewing. It does not provide three-dimensional rendering. Uh, and I've sure talked to a few other people. That will come, be coming out as well. But as from a radiologist pr um, perspective, this is really a lot of all they need. Um, however, as um, Dr. Cleo said, it is much better, or I wouldn't say much, it is better from the patient-doctor relationship to be able to look at something as it is seen in, in a 3D environment. And, and we, that's, well, we do all of this and I show patients their images when they come to see me just like this because we have it on packs and they, you know, push around the DICOM images all over our enterprise. Uh, but, you know, you can DICOM 3D images too. I assume one day they're going to have the software to take the source data and reconstruct it. Uh, but uh, the, um, you can actually, on most of the, uh, modern CT scanners uh, doing multiplanar or three-dimensional reconstructions is, is almost a push of a button now. It used to be very time intensive by the technologist, but especially for what we call MPRs or multiplanar reconstructions, I think they just push a button and they'll come up in the sagittal and the coronal and oblique views. I mean, it's uh, it's great, especially if you're looking at complex anatomy. Uh, so um, it's um, it's exciting stuff, um, and um, you know it really helps you with the detail for sure. Awesome. Okay, well, with the, on that note, maybe you want to take us off 
uh, subject here with something a little less medical, and then we'll pop back into our main topic, which is the GE uh, CT scanner that's been hitting the news and, and, and get some blow-by-blow -blow analysis from Dr. Cleo's. So, Chris, why don't you drop in with another news item? Okay. Um, so, yeah, non-medical related, really, um, but something just I, I noticed in the news at CES, um, which went kind of a little under the radar, um, is here on YouTube. If you just type in, if you go to TCT's page, it'll be also be in our show notes, um, and it's a uh, talk with uh, FSL3D, who is the SLA, they have the Pegasus printer, that is uh, basically a Form 1 uh, contender or a, a competitor, and uh, some real great prints coming off of it. Um, but in this interview, uh, at about a minute 23 in, he uh, uh, mentions the, his, this new SuperVAT technology. Well, Chris, when we were in their booth, he mentioned the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I just wanted to make note of it because uh, I felt it was newsworthy that what I've experienced, you know, with my little RP SLA printer when I'm, I basically am making Petri dishes and uh, they, the lifespan of an SLA dish or the vat, if you will, is very limited and so maybe 10 or 20 but he's claiming with their super vat that they can get uh, maybe ten th or uh, maybe over a thousand cycles on one vat. So I'm real interested in getting my hands on one of their super vats and probably going to retrofit my little RP to uh, use it. So I felt that that was a, a newsworthy item. Oh, I agree. And if I remember correctly, Chris, you had me relay the question to him: Is he going to provide that technology for other people? And he That's seemed right. hesitant. So, I, you know, they may just keep it to themselves. And if you also remember, there's been some controversy with them. Uh, and we, we talked to some of some, of, and I won't mention them by name, uh, resin manufacturers that they are really trying to, what would you call it, encapsulate the whole process and not allow, I can't use the word allow, his wording was that nobody else could match their formula uh, the reality is, from what other people have said, they've kind of set it up so that if you use somebody else's formula, that they keep track of it and when actually will disable the printer. You know, again, that's a rumor. I tried to approach that, and I kind of they they skirted around and pretty much said that nobody can match their formula. So I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I do think with that kind of rumor going out there that more than likely this type of process that they're using for the bed will not be used um, outside of their company unless somebody licenses it. So that could happen too. Either way, uh, I don't I don't think that it's I, I think that they're gonna take my money and I'm I'm gonna get a hold of some of these super bats. <laughs> and if anything, uh, if if anybody wanted to find a market, I mean if you you could just buy a printer and become a reseller on the internet of these vats, there's no way they can control who's getting which vats. I don't think. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, however, it, it is an interesting note that they they will have a, a a neat technology, and you know I hope they do share it. Or as you said, somebody is entrepreneurial enough to buy up a whole bunch of them, or find out the material and and, and work with them. So right. Yeah, so okay. I just thought that was newsworthy, and uh, we'll go on to our next item. Uh, sure. So let's jump right into, and I just, uh, I've got one other item that I wanted to bring up, but I'll bring this one up first. And let me go to the, actually, Siobhan showed this to me, and that is, uh, Time had an article about, and I, uh, you know, again, here's these <laughs> high-profile titles, Freakishly High Definition. Uh, future of body scanning. And if you go through the article, they have some static images as well as some, um, what would you call it, animations of the scans that are coming off of this. So I immediately called uh, Dr. Cleas and said, hey, have you heard of this? He goes, uh, yeah, that's been around for some time. Really burst, bursted my bubble. I thought I had <laughs> something, but I knew better. Dr. Cleos is really on top of this. Uh, like I said, having an engineering background, He's probably quite familiar with what they're doing. So I am going to um, 
pop up the GE, which has a few more images. I'm going to rotate them slowly. And Dr. Cleos, why don't you kind of give us the background of this? Burst my bubble again. I don't want to burst your bubble, Chris. You're a nice guy. But uh, what we're seeing is uh, 3D technology, which has been around for at least a decade plus. And um, as you've seen the advancements in CT technology, we came to a point where we had true volumetric imaging capabilities probably 15, 20 years ago. And the key was to basically have what we call an isotropic, isotropic voxel, okay? Because the earlier CT scanners from the 1970s, 1980s, the resolution in the XY plane, which would be like a cross-section, when we saw that CT scan that you were showing of yourself, that's a cross-section through you. So that cross-section, the resolution in the XY plane was much higher than what you could get in the Z plane because these, you got to remember, they were one slice scanners and they took probably five minutes to get one image. You know, the, the scanner would have to rotate around and rotate back 180 degrees. With the advent of what we call helical technology where the gantry just continuously spins in one direction and the patient kind of goes through and it slices them up like a spiral sliced ham and then multiple detectors, that's when you had what we call the isotropic voxels as opposed to anisotropic. That means the resolution is the same in both the XY and the Z plane. So once you have an isotropic, vo isotropic voxel, you have true 3D imaging and that allows you to take that information and you can cut it up any way you want. You can reconstruct it in the multiple different planes, an off-axis plane. You can go do what we call curved planar reconstructions, which I use in my particular field, which is vascular and interventional radiology, where you reconstruct a vessel right down the course of the vessel itself. The technologist actually puts um, little uh, seed points along the course of the vessel, and then you can reconstruct along the length. So all of that has been available, and you can produce these fabulous images, which are great for showing your patients. And I do think that there is some utility in certain situations um, for doing 3D reconstructions. And we do the 3D all the time like when we're doing vascular planning for putting a stent graft in somebody that's got an aneurysm and I think they showed one of those images in GE but we can actually put a device inside someone's vessel that excludes the bulbous dilation of the artery uh, and prevents it from rupturing and that used to be an open procedure but now that we have this 3D stuff we can actually do it you know all through small little catheters and that's facilitated through this 3D technology. Uh, what, heavy duty. All right, it's great stuff, but what that, what GE, the, the great thing about GE, the, the, it's a temporal issue, okay? When you started off, CT scanners could only scan the head. That was it. And you know why they could only scan the head? Because it didn't move, right? I mean, it took 20 minutes to get one slice when the first scanners came out, so you couldn't have anything that was moving. You know why you could image the lungs or the abdomen or anything like that. So you had the head, and that was a, a unique area to image because we didn't have any good way to image the brain before that. After we sped up these machines, reduced the reconstruction time, and the technology has improved, we went ahead and started imaging the body. All right? Now what we're trying to image is stuff like the coronary arteries. And you got to remember the vessels that are around the heart, not only do they have blood flow in them, they're only three millimeters in diameter, and they're moving constantly. Right? So every time the heart contracts, these vessels are moving. So if you're trying to image something in fine detail, and it's moving constantly, that adds another level of difficulty. What we've done to accommodate that type of imaging, the 3D imaging of like the coronary arteries, is they gated these patients and you would put a EKG monitor on them and what, the, what that does is it's connected to the CT scanner and the CT scanner only emits radiation during a certain phase of the cardiac cycle hopefully diastole when the heart's resting. And so it's the like a threshold switch. That's exactly right. that that you're actually you're showing one right now. That's a coronary angiogram done with CT and you can actually see the patients had some stents placed in there and there's some irregularity in some of those vessels, but that's a beautiful image of the vessels superimposed right on the heart and you can color them differently and make that stuff stand out. Now, with the advent of what GE is showing, what they've done is they've improved the speed of the technology. So, 
for instance, we have a scanner at our hospital right now, which was the latest and greatest GE offered probably five, six years ago. It was called um, the uh, 750, the HD 750. The gantry speed on that device is 0.35 seconds. So every 0.35, it took one revolution 0.35 seconds. So you could do almost three rotations a second, right? Every 180 degrees, you get one set of images, right? Because it's an x-ray. So you don't have to go all the way around. You just have to go halfway around. Um, that allows you to scan the entire body from head to toe in about a little over, you know, 35, 40 minutes. Like these images right here you're showing. Beautiful images of the vasculature. The new scanner, the revolution that they're showing right here, has reduced that gantry rotation to 0 0.28 seconds in a rotation. So now you truly have more than three images per second or rotations per second each 180 degrees providing a uh, set of data. What they've also done is they've improved the imaging chain where you can actually have a field of view in one s slice that's 160 millimeters or 16 sonometers, whereas previous technologies are almost a fourth of that, like 40 sonometers, like four, um, four, I'm sorry, 40 millimeters or four sonometers. So now with the improved speed, the increased range of coverage, you can actually image the heart in one rotation in 0.25 seconds. Wow. So the problem with imaging a moving structure is now obviated because what we run into, if a patient comes in and they're nervous about getting the scan, what's going to happen to their heart rate? It goes up, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a patient with a heart rate in the 90s, it's very tough to image them when the heart's still because it's only still for a fraction of a second as you get faster and faster you don't care anymore because you can image them so fast that you can go in between the heartbeat so i think that's where it's really going to make a difference so as they put a pulse they put a pulse meter on you and it images exactly. It's a, they put an EKG on you, Chris, and they they look at your uh, EKG, and there's you know there's a P wave and there's a QRS and a T wave, and those show you when the heart's moving and when and it's the machine, not moving. And, and the, the machine, machine fires reads, automatically. That's exactly it. Reads oh, the heart cool. when the heart is still, so you can image it. Right. Um, now, see the problem we have is patients either come in with a fast heart rate or they've got a disease process like atrial fibrillation where the heart's irregular. So, you know, you're counting on the heart to have regular interval slow beats and then you can image in between. If the heart rate's irregular, then you can't do this. You can't image their coronaries. So it's allowing us to encompass a wider range of patients just despite their disease processes. It's exciting uh -huh. stuff. I don't want to uh -huh. bust your bubble too much, but the images they're no, showing you are actually available in the here and now. And I've seen, well, you're showing, this is a post-surgical image and it's showing you actually the uh, side plate and osseous screws in a complex fracture. That's I have those two, I have these plates in my leg, yep. the, the same exact ones are in my leg. <laughs> yep, you say you're in Living that, living on the edge, Chris, <laughs> breaking up your joints huh, and your, and your 15, extremities. Fifteen years those things have been in me. Yeah, yeah, that's, but you know, we, a lot of times I, we actually see the 3D recons for complex fractures because that helps the surgeons with the pre-procedural or pre-operative planning. You know, we can tell them the thing's comminuted, there's fracture fragments all over the place, but when they have to go in there and extrapolating that 2D information, that cross-sectional information into a 3D object can be difficult if it's very complex. So a lot of times we do 3D reconstructions in the here and now on these very complex fracture injuries. Wow. Okay, so let's move into something else that's very important that's identified in, in their promotional material, and that is low dosage. You know, a lot of people are aware of or have heard or even scared of the fact is that CTs emit radiation. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in the news, some of it hype, some of it uh, true, that, uh, and, but the, I don't know if there is a correlation, but uh, there has been some conversation that if you are you get a lot of x-rays or a lot of CT uh, radiation that down the road you could um, develop cancer. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any real concrete correlation in that yet, but one of the things that, um, that I have read, especially in Siobhan's case, 
is that we try to minimize the number of CTs, especially the, the head CTs because of the amount of energy that's involved. But one of the things you talked about in your interview before and one of the things that they promote in this GE scanner is that because they're doing more computational, uh, what do you want to call it, they can use lower power. So this is an important step as well. Not only can you get faster scans, but you're having to use less energy to get them. You want to elaborate a little bit on that? Mike, that is an excellent point, and that's where I see the technology really taking off, is getting the same quality of scans and images that we have now with uh, and reducing the uh, amount of radiation that the patients are getting. And it's interesting to watch the history of all this before probably 1990, 1995, 2000 even, the NRC, the National Regula the Na uh, Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission, never had any limits on medical imaging x-rays. You know, you could get, you, you, they had limits on, you know, workers who were exposed, medical workers who were out in, in, in an x-ray uh, field or industry workers are working around nuclear power plants. You all wear these little badges and they give you your radiation exposure. Um, and there was limits, and if you went over those limits, they would make you stop working. There was never any such limits for patients. You could come in and have a thousand scans a year and probably get a tremendous radiation dose. And the problem with radiation, the effects are what we call stochastic. You don't know what minimal dose you need to actually develop a cancer. So the best thing to do and what we try to promote is what we call ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. Okay, that's the, that's the premise that we have is to get the information you need and expose the patient to the least amount of x-rays as possible. And we've got conflicting issues here because you want to get the information you need, you want to limit your dose, but because of the litigious nature of medicine in the United States, patients, in my opinion, will get multiple scans um, that are basically CYA because everyone's afraid of getting sued if they miss something subtle. And the problem is they take that one issue out of context and they'll say, well, why didn't you image the patient again? You could have picked this up if you didn't do this. And like if you try to say well the patient already had 15 CT scans last month and we didn't want to do you know you're going to get sued so that there's a, a, a a legal issue that kind of makes the waters a little murky but having said that what's going on now is that we're actually developing techniques to minimize the amount of radiation and preserve image quality. You got to remember that the uh, the inventors of CT scanning, Godfrey Hounsfield and his team over in London, England, they developed a technique called uh, filtered back projection where they actually used um, uh, the information that was generated by the scanner to reconstruct those images. And the problem was it makes something, it makes certain assumptions of the model of the CT scanner and uh, there's some inherent inaccuracies and just like if you take a gun out to the range and you want to find out how well it's shooting the more times you shoot that gun you're going to get a better idea of what the precision is because you're going to get an average of those shots and you're going to see where they are relative to the target so the same thing's true with CT. If you want to get more information, you give the patient more radiation, and you're going to average out somewhere near the center. The problem is you're giving the patient more radiation. They're now coming out with statistical techniques to actually analyze the uh, inherent uh, fluctuations in the electronics of the CT scanner and some of the uh, other issues that uh, affect image reconstruction to basically um, model some of these limitations and reduce the amount of radiation and still maintain that quality. What's coming out now, which is not here quite yet, is called model-based iterative reconstruction. And uh, what that is, is actually taking into account the actual dimensions of the uh, X-ray beam uh, the dimensions of the detector on the other side because it's assumed that the detector is a point. It's assumed that the beam coming through the patient is a line, which is not true. It's a volume. And once you can model all that stuff, you can reduce that dose even more. The problem, wow. of course, right now is that it's very computationally demanding. And to very take an average CT scan to reconstruct it takes almost a week right now. But as soon as the technologies catch up and somebody comes up with a better way to model all this, stuff, you're going to see an existential leap in the uh, quality of uh, or maintaining the quality of CT scans without jeopardizing, uh, you know, patient safety. Well, yeah, the, uh, the world record. That... Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. 
Well, I was just going to oh. say, I think uh, NVIDIA, um, with their CUDA, their pipeline processor, is being utilized in this particular area now, uh, as I mentioned in the previous interview with you, Dr. Cleo. So it'll be interesting to keep looking into that. And uh, there may be some other processors, but what we're using now for video games also seems to be a being applied to these type of processing as well, which, in my opinion, pipeline processors would would be beneficial here. So absolutely. yeah, and I mean we're, we're seeing important. we're seeing a, a huge explosion in the neural networks uh, 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 chip manufacturer right now. Um, Intel on board. A lot of these other chip manufacturers are revisiting the neural network uh, chips. So uh, the way they uh, they process information through the pipeline is is much different than than the current uh, uh, computer architecture, which is and and basically they're start they they're starting over this the neural network chips have been known for for many years uh, but but most of the major manufacturers went down one they went down one architectural basically uh, p with one architectural plan and now they're revisiting it and they're starting from scratch and they're already they're already making great great gains but the, I I saw too yesterday uh, the world record for a hundred terabyte uh, uh, data sort. Was broken, um, and I think by Apache, by the Apache Foundation, 23 minutes. Wow. They sorted 100 terabytes of data um, and broke the record. So yeah, I mean we're just, I, I mean it's just, it, it's just technology just keeps exponentially moving forward, and I mean it's only a matter of time before you if, walk into an if MRI. If you have some and free time, you may be be an opponent or proponent of Ray Kurzweil, but he has a book called The Singularity. And uh, as we talk about how these things are coming faster and faster, he has actually plotted out when we are going to be at one with uh, technology and Johnny uploading Depp. our program. Starring Johnny Depp. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, we can all be Johnny Depp. It, it's the, I think the Xbox 1080 is going to have an MRI built in. It's a it's <laughs> one second. We're on the Xbox 360, right? Or, and then it goes yeah, 720. And, and, yeah, and it has a couple more iterations and then we'll be there. The be careful with that magnetic field. It's uh, it can be um, deadly. So. <laughs> well, this is a very low dose. I mean, not even enough. Less than your cell phone. Uh, It'll pull your zippers right off your uh, right off your yeah, pants. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah, you need to go back and, and watch Dr. Cleo's video. Uh, so on that note, why don't you bring up a non-medical item in your news there, Chris? If you have. Yeah. Any more, so I'll another, move on to my another last one. Uh, you know, there's just so many to pick from. The, again, I think uh, we're we've seen in the last three years. Um, so many um, filament um, printers hit the market. I mean, I, I was reading a trends report. If you want to go to 3dhubs.com, you can read a trends report, see what's going on as far as the trends. They kind of launched this year a, a big trends report that's really worthwhile reading. Um, but I think this year is definitely, we've already seen the last six months, this is definitely going to be the year of SLA. A lot more SLA printers hitting the market. So I think there's like three or four on Kickstarter right now. I'll just mention this one just because they're the lucky they're the luck of the draw. Um, so the Draken, um, they are claiming though whoa, they are claiming a much lower consumable cost um, than anything else that's currently on the market. And so they have uh, some software and their own kind of it looks like a pretty typical VAT construction yeah. and hardware. Uh, but they already are almost at their at their Kickstarter goal of a hundred thousand dollars. They've uh, they've already made sixty five thousand sixty five thousand uh, dollars at this point, and they've got twenty twenty uh, days to go. So here you can so see. So that's it in the background. That's it in the background. That's the printer in the background, and then on the top shelf they've got so one bottle of Form One resin is the equivalent of five bottles of their resin, and so they're uh, I don't I don't know how they can make it so cheap. But uh, you know, I don't make resin, so um, they're just claiming a lot lower cost of consumables. Okay, so are they providing a printer or resins? I mean, uh, like at this point, yeah, just just a printer with resins. Okay. So and, what's the price of their printer? Um, so the early bird, so about eleven hundred bucks will get you a printer. Yeah, and if you remember, we uh, what was without it? a projector. Yeah. Oh, without. Well, if you remember, we went by XYZ's booth, and they will be providing a similar type of printer 
Um, actually, it's a laser-based printer for $1,500, um, which I thought, as we both did, we reacted fairly surprisingly that, that they could do it about half the cost of the Form 1. Um, and so, but I also noticed is that my journeys through CES that we're seeing some of this where the top looks very much like a Form 1, but uh, they put a DLP projector uh, underneath it. So that's one of the reasons why some of these printers are so tall, because there's a projector in there. Uh, something that I can't, one of them is actually, I think it was the Pegasus, the new Pegasus is going to actually be using a um, DLP based on LEDs, uh, which I guess is going to be the next holy grail, because one, a lot of the LED-based printers are smaller, so that will prevent you having such a long um, base or a tall base, as in the case of this one and others that are on the market, because you have to have some place to put the, the optics as well as the, the projection system. Uh, so that's the big difference. Either they're based on lasers or they're based on DLP projectors. Well, great. That's exciting. All right, so on to my last item. Um, you know, I'm not the only one that was in the news about saving his life or saving his wife's life, but uh, I'll jump right into it. Uh, this is a guy out of England who, with, I think it was either his brother um, who had a 3D printer, but decided that he thought it was a good idea because I guess he had his appendix removed and um, had been diagnosed with kidney stones, hey, wouldn't it be kind of neat to actually print it and actually show where the kidney stones are? And so there he is holding it while he's still uh, recovering. And uh, yeah, kind of neat. Uh, however, the printer he used is a little more uh, expensive than what I have. And he was using a ProJet 660, uh, a little bit out of my price range. What's the price on that? Do you remember, Chris? On the project, oh, uh, six, six, uh, project? Um, isn't it like thirty, fifty thousand dollars? Ah, uh, it's gonna be, I, it's gonna be fifty, fifty thousand would probably. So it's a little bit more than what I spent on mine, but it is still cool. The the cool thing about the projects is that they are multicolor, and I say multi and not uh, dynamic colors. You can't get more than I think two hundred fifty six or sixty five thousand. Uh, colors, but uh, they do provide colored plastics, and they can be very good in, in accentuating things. So hats off to them. Uh, I think it goes through a little bit more. It was either his brother or it was a relative who had the use of it, and they took, like I did, their CT scans and then isolated it and created this. And I guess they talked to some uh, surgeons, and they feel that, yes, this could possibly save money in the future, uh, for planning is, you know, just as like in the case that um, in, in, my, in my situation. It's kind of ironic, and I'm glad personally, that, you know, once a story like this is released, then you have a lot of other stories coming out of similar people doing it. The other thing I want to point out, and I mentioned it early on, is that I think it was actually Europe, uh, um, what do they call the, in the entire Europe, uh, environment, not just a particular company, the, uh, I can't think of it right now, but they've kind of established regulations or at least allow 3D printing to be utilized now and in one of the countries, I think it was Yugoslavia, uh, one of the Slavic countries, they uh, also are taking insurance to do some of this. So uh, we are seeing a momentum to be able to use this more. And in my discussions with uh, the medical community uh, and some of the research centers, uh, this is this is coming to us too uh, very soon. And in some cases in research, we're already seeing it done. I, I was just told the other day somebody had come to me to do volume rendering, found out they're already doing it uh, with this person's daughter. And uh, they're establishing uh, tangible models out of Colorado. So there's a place that is already set up to do this um, in Colorado. But again, you know, it's cool. People are taking it upon themselves to, you know, to do these type of things and then share them with their doctor's physician. And as, as Dr. Cleo said, you know, that's the kind of doctor you want, one that's receptive to this and can discuss it and, as he said, dispel the myths if there are there, but talk technically about it and just instead of just dismissing it. And, you know, I've seen both ends of that, and uh, I totally agree with him. So, again, hats off. 
and what Mr. John Cousins is the name, and yeah, he's been floating around. He's on Engadget, so he's on viral as well. <laughs> it's so look out, look out, Mike. So, You've got some competition. Yeah, yeah. I don't look at his competition. I know. Do you I'm want to add anything it. to that? Um, you know, we talked about this in the seminar, and you actually showed me. What was it? Uh, the cochlea. The uh, cochlea. Yeah, it was. Um, uh, I actually, right before that um, seminar that we had, I was out at the FMA, the Florida Medical Association, and uh, one of the uh, uh, kids uh, from uh, it was FSU, Florida State University Medical School, who happens to be the son of one of my partners, was presenting a paper. Um, on um, something about the cochlea and he had in his hand a model of the cochlea and the semicircular canals. I wish I had it to show you guys right now uh, but it was fabulous and I'm like where did you get that from? And he goes, oh it was great. He goes there was this uh, uh, 3D mod, there was a 3D or there was source data from an MRI of the inner ear that he just got off the internet and he took that source data and uh, it was open source uh, you could take it if you wanted it and he sent it off to some company I was hoping it was you guys and they made a 3D model for him and uh, they sent it back so that when he was again talking to people looking at his research he could kind of show them in detail what he was talking about that's where I really see this 3D stuff is in education it's fabulous I mean because you can you can display something in 3D and the old adage that a picture's worth a thousand words uh, if that's true then I would say that uh, a 3D model is probably worth 10,000 an order of magnitude I mean it's really helpful and that's why I got interested in doing what I'm doing uh, with my YouTube channel and putting stuff out there to try to model difficult medical topics um, in a manner that is Understandable. I don't know if I'm accomplishing that or not, but I'm trying. So <laughs> it's great. It's great. We Seems really appreciate everything you do. And hopefully, some of the people who watch this will take the opportunity. Uh, and you know, a little backstory. I asked uh, Dr. Cleo's to come on and provide me or have permission to use his videos and some of the seminars and the talks that I was giving because they are concise and they break things out. And and he is also a 3D animator, so I'll let him fool you. Um, he, he's using one of the, the older applications, um, but he does a really good job of using 3D animation to, to show and explore uh, the processes of MRI. In fact, you know, while we're on that subject, I have, unless I've lost it here, uh, what did I do with that? Here we go. I'm going to play this little video for you. <laughs> uh, this is uh, something that uh, yeah, that's Dr. Cleo has put together, and this is on diffusion weighted imaging. And this is a two part diffusion series. Diffusion weighted and diffusion and tensor imaging are MR that, techniques you know, that can really evaluate and quantify molecular long. diffusion. Hey, Mike, we, can, we can't hear this. Yeah, yeah. we focus solely yeah, you on the volume down on that thing. Yeah, that's yeah. better. Oh, With a subsequent oh, okay. video Hang describing on diffusion second. tensor imaging. Let me turn it all over. I just turned it off. There we go. Now it's off. All these are great. These, uh, yeah, but you know what people aren't aware of is that you did all these animations yourself. You talk sorry. about the whole process. You have one on the the, the theory of MRI as well. Uh, that's uh, that you should watch before watching it. And like I said, we don't have a lot of time talking about, it, but diffusion tensor and diffusion uh, weighted imaging is not the next step, but it plays an important role in MRI. So maybe we'll just use that as a cliffhanger to have you back on to talk about that. Because one of the things that uh, you and I are working on, I've been dragging my feet on, is creating a tangible model of a diffusion tensor model. I can't what wait to see that, Chris. I'm, I'm all excited. I'm just um, waiting for you to so, show me that model. So <laughs> I can I can I I just got to interject for two seconds because like so you're on this note of an MRI. An MRI is is basically measuring the density of water molecules, correct? That's exactly. You're you're measuring protons, which is it's actually the the, the nucleus of water. So. so what I was thinking the other day, you got to check this out. So here's a little model I did, a little mock-up model, and what it is is it's a, a cylinder like a, basically an aquarium, if you will, and it's filled with like water or DI water or salt water, and then you could put a part in there and take an MRI of a part, right? So oh, you, you mean. Yeah, because it would be everything else would show up black if it's not if it's just a, a piece, right? Right, and you could basically do a subtract, and you'd end up with like a 3D scan of a part. 
That's uh, that's kind of interesting. See, that's what I'm I'm hoping will happen with this stuff, Chris. Is you just you present the technology, and somebody with a little more information will say, "Hey, I wonder if that." technology will apply to my issue. So I think that's great you're thinking about that. And actually, Paul Latiber, the guy that uh, discovered or invented MRI, basically, that's exactly what he did. He took regular water, little capillaries of regular water, and he stuck them in heavy water. And the difference between regular water and heavy water, of course, is that the, um, that they, the that's exactly right, the, the nucleus in heavy water has a neutron adja adjacent to your proton, so it doesn't spin and create that small magnet that's associated with the protons of regular water. And that's how he subtracted out that information and showed that you could localize these NMR signals in space. So uh, I think it's great. You're thinking outside the box, man. Keep it up. Awesome. Well, I was just making sure I was on the right yeah. track. I, I wanted think it's to great. talk to somebody here and maybe you get might a be on your way when you go. Yeah, when you're on your yeah, way to Oslo to pick up that Nobel Peace Prize, you remember us little guys, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Yeah, Chris sent me an email and I said, yeah, go for it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, great he's stuff. encouraged now. You see that, like, he's got a white lab coat too, so he's, <laughs> he's putting himself... <laughs> Okay, so let's go on to I our can eat March 15th. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, listen, I'm going to have to roll out of here. I appreciate the invite, but if I don't start working, my partners are going to fire me here. So. Okay, well, thanks so much for. Uh, I, I can't you say know. that we make enough money to support you here either. Yeah, yeah I'm just, uh, my wife is uh, accustomed to the way she's living right now, so I need to keep going. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thanks well, so thank much. Thank you very and, much, uh, Dr. Cleos. All right, we'll guys, thank so you. Hope, hope to see you again you. soon. Absolutely. Okay. Always interesting. Have a great right. day. You too. Uh, you too. Bye. So, so Mike. So here, let me go on. To, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. I want to really kind of run through the rest of it because we are. Yeah. Running. Yeah, we're running out of time here. And uh, um, so, what? It, uh, the next uh, next uh, news item, or I guess uh, we're on to I'm products. Looking, of them. Yeah. So let's go through projects real quick, and mine are real easy. As you know, I. Uh, had been doing some printing over the weekend. Uh, we wanted to do a, no, a new skull, so with the new Maker Gear M2, uh, with its new extruder, I think it's one of the better skulls I've made. I also used um, what, what is that uh, material called? It is like a brush-on epoxy. XTC 3D from Reynolds AM. So yep. uh, Reynolds material um, again, thumbs up to them. It you know it does provide a glossy, but uh, you can kind of if you need to have it, you can either spray on a, a matte finished or you can just um, use some sandpaper on it to diffuse it a little bit. Right. Um, but it does add some strength to it. More hmm. importantly, and I didn't really have a problem. That's the cool thing about this Maker Gear uh, and some of the material I'm using. And this is a natural material for Maker Ball. There is very little ridging. Uh, so, you know, if you can get your machine tuned, you can find that you can do away with it. But the big plus of the material is that it fills in those gaps. So if you spray it or paint it afterwards, it is like smooth like an SLA printer. So keep that in mind that, you know, and it's really cheap. It's like $20. I have to say um, printing was a little expensive. But uh, it's not that expensive and well worth it. But again, this is the skull that you see that she's showing. Um, it came out really well, and again, I used limited supports. Uh, I used Simplify 3D, where you can control your supports, and I pretty much put it in the the sockets and then a couple of other areas, and uh, just be able to pull them out. Uh, unlike uh, you know some of the other slicers, where you don't have control over it and you spend all day trying to remove it, I just put strategic uh, uh, supports in there, and for the most part, it didn't require. And then, you know, what's interesting, he, too bad Cleos, uh, Dr. Cleos is gone. Here is one of the first skulls done with one of the first CTs. And notice the ridging on the one on my right versus this other one that is fairly smooth. A lot of that has to do with the CT technology as well. And depending on where you go for your CT, some of them are still using older ones. Or more importantly, they reduce the amount of, and we just talked about dosage, by using wider steps or slices uh, for preliminary scans to prevent you being, you know, radiated. Um, however, with this one here, the dosage was higher, but as you can see, it's in much more detail. And this is the one that was done, what was it, immediately after? Yeah, I think this was immediately done right after surgery. And as you can see, you can now see the, the hole that was placed in there. Um, 
but you know, really neat technology. And you know, as Dr. Gardner said, uh, it's an important step. He, he, he thinks the resolution still needs to be improved to be of any surgical benefit from his perspective. But for training and planning, he he does, he does see some real positives there. So the other project that I've been working on, the the drum roll. <laughs> Are you ready? Yep. Oh, it is. You are in 3D um, Oculus so actually Land. I took my VR1 and modified it and put the structure sensor on it. And if you've had a chance to follow them in the news, they have used the structure sensor now to map out a 3D environment and feed that information back into the iPad screen. So as you're walking around, you don't bump in the walls, so it adds the ability of mobility. <laughs> the problem is it was just an iPad, so what did I do? In here, I have an iPhone 6, the structure sensor, and will be moving soon to provide the ability uh, to view 3D and move around in it. Isn't that awesome? That is pretty so, cool, um, Mike. Yeah. And Occipital, or Jeff... Uh, from the CEO of Subcipital said they will be putting on an SDK to provide that capability. And really, if you're using the Unity engine, there's already built-in um, ability to do stereoscopic and put it right in the goggles. So I've also got my new Spective VR because the one I had either fell off my backpack or somebody decided they needed it more than I do. Uh, this was in this is in green, an emerald green. It's a little bit larger to handle the six plus. Um, so if you want something kind of funky and cool, it is lighter weight than some of the plastic, and it's about half the price of some of them. I like it. I think it's kind of retro and cool. Um, and we've shown this on the show before, but they now make a deluxe version of it. So that's another project I've been working on. And where else are we? Oh, I have been moving forward with my app to use the grip and shoot, if you remember we talked about that, plus making four eyes scannable in iOS. So that's coming really soon. And uh, let's see what else. Ah, that's it. Other than you've got some news on your TAS 4. Yeah, well, I played with it. Um, I, I put my uh, dual extruder head on my TAS 4. Um, so for 500 bucks, they sell a dual extruder head. I got the Ninja Flex head, so it'll do uh, Ninja Flex on the second alternative material, um, or the alternate material. Um, so it it worked it works fairly well. Um, it takes a little bit of uh, kind of finesse to because you've got basically two heads and they're at the same height, so they're kind of scraping over the same areas, um, and they and you really do have to be really uh, conscious of how you're setting your offsets and stuff. But setup went was a breeze. It was literally bolted on, um, and then what I'll do is I'll segue right into my little print whisperer tip of the week. Um, good. Which uh, which is a little tip. It unfortunately uses SolidWorks, um, but um, we should be able to uh, get a. Well, uh, here's hoping that SolidWorks comes out with a SolidWorks light this year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that would be great. So what I've done here is I've created SolidWorks 2015, the the latest version of SolidWorks. Um, allow this year allow the update just came out. And one of the things that's really nice about it is it lets you export additive manufacturing files, AMF files. So what you can do is you can build an assembly or a part with multiple materials. So what I've done here, you can see this disk. This is just like a test print. The inner material I set as one material, the outer as another. And what you can actually do is go up to print the 3D. There's actually a print 3D option right in SolidWorks. They don't really have any machines that I'm aware of that are actually set up quite yet. I think maybe the MakerBot is, um, but none that I have. But what this allows you to do is export um, the AMF file. And under Options, what you can do is um, select to include materials and include the colors. So when you export this AMF file out, of SolidWorks, you can bring it into Matter Control or Slicer or uh, whatever your slicing software is that supports AMF files, and it'll allow you to define, you know, to have two separate materials in the same or three or four or, you know, I mean, they've got these octo heads and things like that that allow you to print 
eight up to eight materials or something like that already, and we're going to mm -hmm. see more and more of this. The 3D system has their Cube Pro that has up to three nozzles. Um, so what you'll be able to do is import the, this this file format. Was it AMF? Is that what you said? AMF is and and what's great is AMF is now becoming a standard um, that I that we're starting to see more and more. Um, which I feel is uh, is definitely um, you know we've been using STL as such an outdated mm -hmm. such an outdated uh, file format that that's been been around for a long time and done done wonders and I you know I you can't say anything bad about STL really except for the fact that it is outdated and it's time to have something new and that's what this AMF is letting us do it's 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 really it's pretty cool I'm happy to see SolidWorks embracing it I know Autodesk has some features that are very similar um, in in Inventor and uh, also I think even coming into their Fusion 360 line well yeah I'll, I'll have to send an email to Autodesk on that and or actually maybe explore it as you know I'm an Autodesk um, Fusion 360 user I love it it's got you know not a Large set of tools, but it's growing, and they do. They just came out with the ultimate, and I did take the plunge and went with the three hundred dollar a year subscription so that I could have that for a lifetime. Um, I think it's affordable, has some great tools. Um, you know, if if you do this on a day to day basis like Chris does, obviously SolidWorks is the direction to go. Um, but I don't do a lot of uh, solid modeling. I'm doing more of it, and I think Fusion 360 is a good alternative, and hopefully it will prompt um, SolidWorks to do something similar. Um, I have, um, let's get into what's coming up and hopefully Chris you go to this. <laughs> um, you know we didn't go last year and we found that it was a fairly good show and that's 3D Printer World. Uh, it's in Burbank between January 29th and 31st. You know Chris if, I don't know if I'll be going but if you can go I'll give you the same setup and then I can man the booth back here uh, and then you could do live on the floor. Uh, you know, uh, having it so close to CES, I don't know if there will be anything new. Um, they do have, they're, obviously they're going to be showing the Voxel 8 if you look here. Um, an interesting 3D printing to a piece of automotive history. Uh, ZBrush, which was also big uh, last year because they're in that area. Um, will be there if you've never used ZBrush. It's a cool tool, and then they have a uh, low-cost, meaning free tool called what is it, Sculptress, uh, that you can download that provides organic modeling. Uh, I guess they're going to be talking about smart stuff. So it, it is another show, and it was fairly popular last year. So you and I should talk about if we can get down there. Maybe I can make some excuse and. Say, hey, we can go down there, Siobhan. <laughs> say, Siobhan's a little tired of 3D stuff for some reason. Um, on that note, we're close to the end, but I wanted to share this little video that uh, I find a little humorous. Not really, but it's fun. If you remember Velcro, we did an interview with him. He created that, uh, that uh, Ducati uh, on the Ultimaker 2, and then I sent him Ducati Girl. Well, he sent me some some footage of <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so pretty cool so he's been putting together so he sent me some footage for me to show pretty neat huh awesome uh, on that note I again just want to say thank you to all and as you can see here I am eating out of my wife's hand <laughs> now I am or so yes the star really of all this and my hero is my wife She's great. Yep. And she is an extremely strong person, smart person, and I'm glad things happened the way they did. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again to all our listeners for joining us, and uh, especially Dr. Cleos and, uh, and uh, Siobhan and Mike. And uh, we will uh, definitely pick it up next week. We've got, we've got uh, let's see, we've got... Uh, um, some some uh, interviews next week, do we, Mike? Uh, there's a possibility that we'll have some interviews lined up. Um, I've been hoping to get MakerBot, but you know I won't go into it. I've said it enough time. I may have irritated them a little bit, but it's funny. I guess you know they're big enough that one department doesn't talk to another because I had somebody reach out to me and say, "Hey, can we use some of those images after they saw the the Make article?" So, right. I said, hey, did you talk to your CEO? I don't think she wants you talking to me. <laughs> 
I don't know about that. Um, but that, awesome. that, that's an interesting story in itself. I broke the news that they're coming out with a 3D scanner, and they literally squashed it um, because they didn't want anybody talking about it yet. But uh, Got it. after talking to the CEO of Soft Kinetics, uh, they have something in the works, but they don't want to talk about it yet. But we'll be on. Uh, we'll be on next week. Uh, I think with Autodesk, and uh, um, maybe some other people. Yeah, and, and I apologize for not having that together. Oh um, no, no worries. And uh, uh, but either way, we will uh, put up the event um, live again as a Google Hangout as the details become available. And we will see you next week. Yeah, can I interject for just a moment? You know. As you may know, we don't put any advertisement on our YouTube videos, so we, it's pretty much Chris and I supporting this ourselves. So if you feel as a listener you like what we're doing, you know, if you go out to my Square Market under Slow 3D Creators, um, I'm giving well, not giving away for five bucks you can get a set of four great All Things 3D coasters. Um, so you know, if you can pitch in, it helps pay the bills, prevents me from having to hang out at McDonald's when my wife kicks me out, but. <laughs> <laughs> Could you uh, imagine me doing this show in the parking lot of McDonald's? Cause oh I'm God! <laughs> uh, but no, I'm serious. So if you if you get an opportunity um, and and you really like what's going on, one subscribe, we'd appreciate that, and two, uh, you know, throw a little bone our way, uh, help keep the production moving and improving. And uh, so, on that note, please close it for us. All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, we will see you next week on All Things 3D. Bye.